Hey, hey, it's your girl, Carla Renata, a.k.a. The Curvy Film Critic. We're going to talk about Amelda Marcos. Apple TV Plus is up and running. I got some more Harriet news and a special interview with Mark Duplass from The Morning Show. Stay right there. You're tuned into Black Hollywood Live, the world's first digital broadcast network devoted entirely to urban entertainment and pop culture. Tune in right now. Hey, 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 it's your girl, Carla Renata, a.k.a. The Curvy Film Critic. Welcome to this edition, episode 84. Five, I believe it is, of the Curvy Film Critic with Carla Renata right here at Black Hollywood Live. You can catch us here every Sunday or a little after the 5 o'clock hour. I hope your weekend has been great. Mine has been fantabulous. If this is your first time joining us, this is how this rolls on this show. I will give you some news reviews. I will sprinkle it with some interviews and a little other stuff here and there. But If you like what you hear, if you like what you see, and again, if it's your first time here, go over to the YouTube if you're watching me there or iTunes or Spotify or Stitcher or iHeartRadio, any of those platforms and give me a thumbs up. Give me some stars. Give me some comments. I am only here because of you. So thank you so much for joining me and let's get right into it. Um... Let me just talk about a couple of things that I did before I get into the reviews. I went to an event on the Array campus, which is a campus that is being, not is being built, but has been built by Ava DuVernay. And basically the campus encompasses a theater, a really nice grand space for talkbacks or maybe receptions or parties or something of that nature. But I went there because she was doing a weekend long tribute to the films of John Singleton. And they showed, I think, four of his biggest hits, Too Fast, Too Furious, Poetic Justice, Boys in the Hood, and there's one other one that the name escapes me, but I went to see Too Fast, Too Furious because I had never seen that particular um, incarnation of that franchise before, and Michael Ealy showed up to have a talk back with Ava DuVernay, but this thing that they're doing there is running through November 4th, which is tomorrow, so if you're in the Los Angeles area, specifically Echo Park, make your way on over to Array. They have some wonderful things happening there. Look them up online if you're not familiar, or go to A Ava's handle at Ava. I'm sure she'll tell you all about it there. I also went to an event for the award season. So I'm a member of the Broadcast Film Critics Association and I'm Rotten Tomatoes approved and a member of AFCA, a a member of the Los Angeles Online Film Critics Association, Cherry Picks, the Online Association of Female Film Critics. And so this is a really crucial busy time of the year for me because everybody has events they have screenings they have parties it's a lot of fun but it's freaking stressful because you're running driving all over town trying to make everything but one of the things that I did make it to is I've been talking to y'all about Harriet and as I mentioned last week when we went off the air I hosted a special Harriet edition of You Know That Scene for Focus Features. And while that was going on, the premiere for Harriet happened this week on November 1st. On that same day, the Focus Features family had a an event where they had Cynthia sing before they uh, had us have lunch and whatnot. So she sang an excerpt of the soundtrack that she co-wrote, co-wrote, <laughs> co-wrote, um, It's a beautiful song, beautiful song. If you have been on my social media anywhere today, I have a little snippet for today's show with her singing part of that song. If you want to see the full part of it, go to my IGTV and the full session of it is there. But she sang a little bit of that song, um, Stand Up, and then she also sang Natural Woman by Aretha Franklin. And as we all know, she has been slated to be Aretha Franklin in the Nat Geo version, Genius that geo version of the film Genius, not to be confused with the Jennifer Hudson film that is coming out. So it's two different projects. One is for television, one is for the theaters. The Jennifer Hudson one is for the theaters. So, but Cynthia sang that and she slammed it and just, just slayed it. It was absolutely wonderful. Speaking of Harriet, I had an opportunity to sit down with Harriet Tubman's great, great grandniece. Her name is Tina Martin Wyatt. Lovely woman, 
hilarious. And we talked about reparations. We talked about her Aunt Harriet, as she likes to call her. And we talked about some other things. So I'd like for you guys to take a listen to that. And then we'll talk about it a little bit more when we come back. About is this $20 bill. So with the recent passing of Representative Cummings, and we know that the Trump administration has pushed it back to 2028, what can a regular citizen like myself do to convince the administration to push it up in order to honor Representative Cummings and better yet, honor Harriet Tubman? Well, what we're saying, what we're telling people to do as a family and things like that, we're saying write a petition, get as many names as you can in your community, your church, your family um, as a group together and send it to the White House, call your representatives, talk about that and, you know, the importance of it. You know, she, she fought in the Civil War. She's an American patriot. She deserves to be on that money. You know, everybody is fascinated by their DNA, and and that all came about way back in the 70s when Alex Haley came onto the scene with Roots. It made people really, really curious about their lineage if they didn't even know at that point. With you you being related to Harriet Tubman as her great-great-grandniece, what was it like for you the very first moment you realized that that woman was your relative? For me, it was just another aunt that I was learning about that did something extraordinary because my grandmother knew her. The way she spoke of it, she said that they were just family, just doing things as families do them, surviving from day to day, living their lives from day to day, continuing to do the things that they were doing before. Like with her, she was continuing to help people. I read this one story where you were talking about um, a teacher walking up to you and asking you that. Uh, That was in high school. You know, I had been learning about African-American history, seemed like all my life, you know, from home, from my church and and other venues. So I said, well, I'm going to do English lit, like literature. But I was leaving my homeroom after this happened. My homeroom teacher stopped me, which I was in a hurry to get to my next class. And she stopped me. She said, Ernestine, she said, is it true that you are related to uh, Harriet Tubman? So I just stood there looking at her because I was dumbfounded and amazed because I said, you know, I haven't told anybody that. You know, the last time I said anything was when I was very, very little. I'm thinking in my mind, how does she know that? <laughs> but then I found up with my mouth and and I said, yes, it's true. And then I scurried off to my class. I could not ask her <laughs> how she knew or anything like that. I wish I had, but I hadn't. You were like, and, I'm uh, really trying to have this conversation right now. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> you know, being a teenager, you know how teenagers are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's how that happened. I love that story. I really wanted to ask you that story because I thought that says so much about how protective people can be of their lives. You know, mm-hmm. that was, I, mm-hmm. I feel like you scurrying off was a, a natural, innate protective mechanism. You know, you, mm-hmm. you wanted to protect who you were. You wanted to protect your lineage. You didn't want to misspeak or have somebody misunderstand what was coming out of your mouth. So you were like, okay, I'm out. I'm just going to leave. Yeah, it possibly could have been going through my mind. But my siblings, I talked to my siblings about it just recently, and uh, and they said, you know, the same thing happened to them. That's what they said. They said, we learned early, too, not to say anything. That's a shame. Yeah. I hate that. I hate that you all went through that, but you're saying something now. But you know what? My granddaughters, the same thing is happening to them. Really? Yeah. See, they told me that. They said the same thing is happening to them. I said, well, I said, you know who you are. Exactly. There's been a whole lot of talk, especially this year, about reparations. And mm-hmm. I just wanted to know what your thoughts were about that and the government making some kind of ruling in favor of that particular item? I think that reparations are due us, and the, but the reparations I feel that are due us is what they took away from us and tried to keep from us, which was being educated. So I think that that's the reparation that we, that's due to us, for, in my opinion. Um, you know, different people may have different thoughts on it, but uh, for me, it's education because I know that education was all always spoke of in my house as your way out, as your way of taking care of yourself, as your way of expanding your mind, the mind that they said that you didn't have. So it was all about overcoming that struggle and not believing what the hype was, you know, in terms of how they tried to keep you down by doing certain things and education was one of them. So I feel like that's what to do with us, is that education. I wanted to know if your Aunt Harriet was here right now, what's the mm-hmm. one conversation you would want to have with her? If you could have one conversation with her, what would that be? About her faith. Mm. That's what I would talk to her about. Because her faith was unwavering. 
the relationship with God was so, it was sealed. It was, she just knew, she just had so much confidence in him. She felt like she was a nobody, you know, when she first heard his voice within her and herself. She felt like she was a nobody. But he told her, he convinced her. He said, you are somebody. And you are somebody that I want to do this. Mm. And so that's when she acquiesced. That's when she said, okay, it's on, God. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. <laughs> I love it. I love, okay, I just want to hang out with you. You are hilarious. Um, <laughs> You really are. And last but not least, I want to talk to you about how satisfying is this for you right now to experience this moment where your Aunt Harriet's story is finally on the big screen. Her entire story, not snippets, but her entire story. I love the film. The movie is accurate. And it shows her soft side. It shows her loving side. It showed her being able to love a man and being loved by a man. It showed her persistence. It showed her determination, her courageousness, her fierceness, being fierce when she had to be. And it showed her faith and her love for family and for people. For somebody that couldn't read or write, she did exactly what God told her to do and what he said in his word for all of us to do. She took herself out of the center and she put other people in it. And that's how she lived her life. I love her for that. I'm in such awe of that in her. When I see certain things and about her and talking about her, it just makes me tearful. And see, I feel like the, I've come to know her as a person, not as just an ancestor, not somebody that, you know, because my grandmother would always say, okay, let's go visit Aunt Harriet. And like a little kid, I'm saying, I don't know her. My grandmother knew her. And she always said Aunt Harriet, Aunt Harriet. My mother always said Aunt Harriet. But she didn't become Aunt Harriet to me until I really, I think I read her the book on Sarah Bradford maybe twice. It was the third time that I read it that, and, and what was the connection for me was her faith. That's what made me start feeling Aunt Harry. Well, I think that's a great place to end on. Miss Tina, thank you so very much for sharing your thoughts and your feelings and your memories about your Aunt Harriet. I wholeheartedly appreciate it. I'm sure everyone will love the film and they will at least love knowing more about Harriet Tubman than they knew before they walked into the theater. So thank you. Yeah, well, see, that's the big thing. She's on the big screen where everybody, all nationalities, all races, all people can see her and, and be inspired by her and that's what's important yes absolutely well thank you i really really do appreciate it oh you're welcome i love talking to miss tina because tina is un now as an adult is unapologetic about being a descendant of harriet tubman and i can wholeheartedly appreciate and understand her hesitancy to to, to divulge that information because like she said she got teased when she was a kid or people thought she was lying and she said that it's cyclical is happening with this generation as well and just like she said they know who they are yes they do and we know who you are too now Miss Tina Martin Wyatt Miss Great Great Grandniece of Harriet Tubman I really appreciated her taking the time to sit down and talk with me um, and Harriet like I said came out this week November 1st to rave reviews rave reviews across the board but of course you know the controversy was still trying to pop up in there and and color and mess up stuff but you know we got this it's all good it got i think it got over 90 percent rating on rotten tomatoes so the critics dug it anybody else that's talking bad about it and talking trash about it let me just say this to you See the film first before you pop off and have all these things to say. Everybody always got something to say based on gossip, based on hearsay, based on what they think the film is about. I talked to many people that are like, oh, I don't want to see another slave film. This is not a slave film. This is a film about Harriet Tubman, the first feature film about Harriet Tubman to exist that's solely dealing with her, not her in the crutch of a story, but her period. It shows Harriet Tubman as a woman, someone's daughter, someone's sister, someone's wife, someone's mother. She is a real flesh and blood human being who had the strength, the tenacity, and the courage to take people from the South to the North at her own peril. And she lived for many, many, many years, was a, um, a spy in the war she accomplished so she had a, she did long, like she did so many other she baked like nobody knew that Harriet Tubman baked who knew that I didn't know that until I saw the film like she's more than a woman called Moses so and I saw somebody say go see a woman called Moses it's better than Harriet it's different it's not better 
is different. And it's Cicely Tyson. How can you compare Cicely Tyson with this? There is no comparison. It's different. And why can't we have both? Why can't we have a television movie, A Woman Called Moses? And why can't we have a feature film by Focus Features called Harriet? We can have both. And we can honor and celebrate both. Both women, Cynthia Erivo and Cicely Tyson. Let's celebrate both of these women and both of these wonderful works of art and not belittle it or talk it down. Because when we do that, then we just mess it up for us. Okay, I'm going to get off my soapbox and stop talking, stop talking about that. <laughs> Let me just acknowledge my folks in the chat room. Y'all know how I roll. Michael B. Mar Marlon Wallace and my girl, Cup of Soul Show. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate y'all wholeheartedly. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Give me a thumbs up and let me know you were here. All right, so let's talk about this film, The Kingmaker. The Kingmaker is a documentary that's on Showtime. It is directed and written by Lauren Greenfield. And when I was growing up, everybody made fun of this woman named Amel DeMarcos. Amel DeMarcos, and they made fun of her because she had, I think she's owned like oh, something like over 3,000 pairs of shoes. I'm like, how can you wear that many pairs of shoes? But she was the, the first lady of the Philippines. And when her husband, Ferdinand Marcos, passed away, she was really grappling, having a hard time with regaining the glory of those days when she was first lady, when her family ruled the Philippines. And um, they were actually ousted out of the Philippines, her and Fernando Marcos. They were exiled over some things that happened. If you watch the documentary, you'll, you'll know what. But um, it centers on the controversial political career because after uh, Ferdinand died, Imelda Marcos and her son and her daughter all entered into the political arena in the Philippines, and it has caused much, much controversy and dismay to the Filipino people. There was one section in particular that struck me very odd. So this is a woman who is no... Well, she's back in political office now, but there, but she's not necessarily in political power, but she's always running around the Philippines giving out money to people that she feels are less fortunate than them. I don't necessarily know how I feel about that. Like if I was someone less fortunate, I don't think you giving me a hundred dollar bill every once in a while is really going to help me. Like I would need for you to change some laws to help me as opposed to giving me some money in my hand. And that's just me personally, but I'm not Filipino and I'm not under that regime in the Philippines. So it's easy for me to pop off and have something to say about it. But what I will say is that when she was in power, well, when her husband was in power, that was a very powerful regime. I mean, he, when he would run off to places, he would leave her to pick up the reins. And there's something very interesting about the documentary. Their reign in political office is very similar, very similar, sans the, the murder situation, to the Trump administration. It's very, very similar. So... I would highly suggest watching it just for that reason. No, it's a compelling, compelling documentary about her in particular. She was gorgeous. This was a woman who grew up as an orphan. She was orphaned as a child and grew up to be the first lady of the Philippines and was, I think she was Miss Philippines in the Miss USA. or Yeah, in the Miss USA, not Miss USA, the Miss, is it Miss USA? Miss Universe, the Miss Universe pageant. She represented the Philippines, and that's how Ferdinand Marcos met her. She went from being an orphan to a beauty queen to running the Philippines, her husband dying, and then coming back in power herself and through her children. It is a deep little tale, but it will be on Showtime. You guys have got to check that one out. It, it starts streaming on Showtime on November 8th. So my review of it will be up tomorrow live and in full effect. You would want to read it to hear the rest of the shenanigans that I have to say about that. I don't want to ruin it for you. But I will say this. Imelda Marcos is a beast. She is a force to be reckoned with. Her time in political reign and how she got there is quite fascinating. The fact that she's a woman and has instituted such fear among her political rivals is absolutely mind-boggling. So that's all I have to say about that. Um, next up is this film I saw called Motherless Brooklyn. Now, Motherless Brooklyn had a little event. This they, you know, like I said, they all have these little events and everything that you go to, and they're a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun at this one because they had like a little jazz combo, and they had some nice little eats there, and it was at this. Um, 
American Legion Hall in Hollywood. I used to live right around the corner from there on a little street called Franklin Place for years. And I used to drive past that Legion Hall and walk past that Legion Hall all the time. Oops, what was that? And wonder what the hell was going on with this Legion Hall. But apparently they renovated it on the inside just for events like this. And it was absolutely beautiful and it's huge. But that aside... Motherless Brooklyn is produced by Warner Brothers in accordance with Ed Norton, who is also directing, he wrote, and he stars in it. It's also starring Gugu Mbatha-Ra and Alec Baldwin. And Norton stars as a gumshoe detective that has Tourette's. His name is Lionel. And he go, he ventures to solve the murder of his mentor and only friend Frank Minna, who is being played by... Um, Oh, shoot. Who is he being played? I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> but Alec Baldwin is fantabulous in this movie. He's having a really good year on film, aside from SNL. Really good year. I really enjoyed him in this. And what I also enjoyed about this film is that it has the jazz music of that era, which is in the 50s, it serves as a, a secondary character almost, in addition to the the cast members it's almost like its own character that film is beautifully shot in brooklyn beautifully shot beautifully beautifully shot but the character having tourette's and being a detective is something i've never seen on film before it's quite intriguing to say the least and edward norton does it very subtly like it's not over the top it's not he's not playing him like he, he's not playing him with Tourette's where it's annoyingly so. It's done very, very subtly. It's done very nuanced. It's very effective and very, very strong. The movie is a tad bit long, though. It was a little long. I was kind of like, oh. The first chapter or the first act of it felt a little less stronger than the second act of it. The second act of the film was fantabulous leading up to um, who actually killed Frank and how, oh, Frank Minna was played by Bruce Willis. I knew it would come to me, Bruce Willis. And he's in the movie for that long. But it's everybody in it is giving really strong performances. Every single solitary person. Willem Dafoe plays Alec Baldwin's brother. And he is, sl- like, of everybody in the film, Willem Dafoe is the one that's kind of crushing it. He is really crushing it. But the film is beautifully shot. The The script is right in line of those film noir-ish kind of... It's like if they took a film off of the film noir schedule at TCM and threw it up into a theater right now, uh, produced by Warner Brothers, it would be right on time. And FYI, but not really, Warner Brothers used to produce a lot of those film noir films back in the day, so it's almost like it it found the right home. At the premiere... um, Edward Norton spoke about how blessed he was to have Warner Brothers be the studio that's producing the film um, and championing, championing, you know what I mean, uh, supporting him through this process because evidently it took quite some time to get it made. And most of the cast, Gugu, Alec, Willem, and Bruce came and did it for little or no money and put their own money into the project in some instances. So I, having said all of that, it's a nice film to see just because it's different. It's not the same old, same old. It's nice to see something with a film noir throwback. It was really quite stellar. I enjoyed it immensely. Um, but it is produced by Warner Brothers, and I believe it is about to be in theaters quite shortly, if it's not out there already. All right. Honey Boy. Honey Boy is a film that I saw at... Sundance and it stars Shia LaBeouf and it's directed by Alma Haral. Basically Shia LaBeouf's character was a child star and his dad who was his guardian at the time called him Honey Boy. When I tell you Shia LaBeouf is giving the performance of his life in this movie I do not exaggerate. It's a deep little tale of verbal abuse, mental abuse, uh, parental abuse. He has his father who tried to have a career in show business, wasn't successful. He had his own issues, but tried to support and and pull his son up into the ranks. And then the son became a grown man, and it became 
that whole relationship was very contentious. It's very much a daddy issue film, but it's a daddy issue film that I would highly suggest watching. It's deep and it's intense and it's a lot going on, but it is totally worth it just to see Shia LaBeouf because he is absolutely wonderful in it. And at that film is being produced by Amazon Studios. All right. Now, let's talk about this next one, which is The Morning Show on Apple TV+. Plus. Now, Apple TV+, Plus is a new streaming service. I've been talking about Disney+, Plus, so there's all these streaming services now. You know, at first we were just getting used to Hulu and Amazon and Netflix, and, and uh, there's a couple, couple of other ones. We were just getting used to those. I think it was like four or five. Now we got Disney+, Plus. now we got Apple+, Plus. Nat Geo is coming out with some stuff. Everybody got a streaming channel, but Apple+, Plus TV started streaming this week on November 1st, I believe, or a little earlier than that. And they are offering one week free. So you don't have to subscribe to it for a whole week. And, you know, they give you a trial to see how you feel about it, see, you know, if if you're vibing with it, if you want to be bothered with it. But one of the shows that's streaming on it that I absolutely love is the show called The Morning Show. It stars Jennifer Aniston, Reese Witherspoon, my girl Gugu and Bata Ra is in that as well. And Mark Duplass. So Mark Duplass plays Chip. He plays the, I guess you would say he's like the executive producer of the morning show. And this is a deep little show because it's dealing with a morning show very similar to the Today Show where their lead anchor, star of the network, is being accused of sexual harassment, sexual misconduct, whatever you want to call it. It's very much a hashtag Me Too situation, and these young ladies have built a whole show around it. So I had a little conversation with Mark about that, and I'm going to play that, and then we'll talk about it when we come back. So I'm really excited about it for a variety of reasons, mostly because it's dealing with an elephant in the room kind of subject that hasn't really been dealt with this broadly and this boldly on television before. I'm I'm excited about it and I'm excited about you in it. Thank you. Of course, of course. I do know something about you that you probably don't think I know. I was invited to see a film called Unlovable that was written by Charlene de Guzman, yeah? That's right. And I know that you guys met via Twitter. Yeah. In one of the episodes, there is this whole conversation about Twitter fighting. Because there can be Twitter fighting, and then there can be Twitter alliances like what you had with Charlene. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a really interesting question. You know, look, Twitter's just a, it's just a place and a medium. You can use it for whatever you want. It's become somewhat vitriolic and, and hateful. Um, but uh, you don't have to use it that way, you know? And... Um, it is true. I met Charlene de Guzman uh, through Twitter, and we birthed this beautiful project together. And everybody should see the movie Unlovable. It's it's wonderful. And you know, I try to use my Twitter account the way I try to use everything else, which is, what do I uniquely have to offer, and why am I here? And if I'm not offering something unique and worthwhile, I shouldn't do it. I feel like if you want to cut through on Twitter, I think that positivity and porch. And a gentle, kind war on asshole behavior is a nice way to do it on Twitter. (laughs) I kind of like how you stated that. That was perfectly said. I also discovered, or not discovered, but I realized that you have a tendency to be drawn towards stories that elevate really strong women. I saw you in Tully. I've seen Bombshell. I saw you in that. And now I'm watching you on the morning show. What is it about those stories that makes you want to be a part of them when it comes to well, elevating that's strong really women. Of you to say, and I, I appreciate you noticing that it is something I've made an effort on lately, and candidly, it's something I had a little bit of a blind spot to in the early part of my career. I think that my brother and I, for a while, were making movies mostly about ourselves because we felt that most art, when you're younger, that's good is autobiographical. You tend to make movies about yourselves. And I've made movies about white guys for a long time. Now I'm in a really lovely position of some kind of power or platform. So we try to use our our company to not only hire female directors and persons of color and tell those kinds of stories, but perform her to be a part of the morning show, to be there to support Reese and Jen's vision of what a Me Too movement show could be and be on Bombshell and, and support Charlize Theron in one of her most challenging roles. You know, she had so much to do with the accent and the physicality and the makeup and the hair. She just needed someone 
who could be a scene partner who could, could really be there for her and, and help her put in that great performance. And I think part of that is because I have two young daughters and so I live in a house full of women, so I've become more sensitive to that. And part of that is I read Melinda Gates' book about how empowering women really will be the, the center of global change, and I believe that. Yeah, I'm just trying to like do my little part, basically. You're doing a huge part. I mean, I, I you're right. You did make a lot of movies with, with your brother, and, and it mostly did focus on white dudes. You're absolutely right about that. But this seismic shift that you're making is really powerful and I for one as a woman of color I really applaud you for doing that because I think it's important that someone like you get behind that voice and support it like you are so thank you for that. In the context of the morning show there is a little bit of an ageism thing going on where they're trying to push this female anchor out and I'm not sure really if it's an ageism thing with Jennifer Aniston's character as much as it is they're trying to get rid of the other part of the scandal. Having said that, have you as a male in Hollywood experienced any type of ageism? I have experienced ageism and uh, the reality of it is that it has gone in my favor. Weirdly, in my 20s, I was for better or for worse competing for roles of hot young male love interest and I was not either good looking enough or whatever enough to get those roles. And as I've gotten older and the gray hairs are coming in and I have dad energy, um, (laughs) now I actually, there are many more roles available to me, which is crazy. I think it's real. You know, my wife is is an actor and a filmmaker and she just turned 40 and, and she is watching the roles diminish before her eyes of what she feels is being offered to her and what it comes her way and and i am watching them increase as a as a male and i don't know if that is specific to all uh gender lines but it's certainly happening in my house and it seems unfair and selfishly i'm happy i'm getting more work but it's kind of fucked up yeah i I would agree with that i'm right there with you on that one this show seems to be very groundbreaking from what I see. It's kind of like, remember that film Network a long time ago? It feels like this century's network, but for television. It's written really smartly. It's acted phenomenally with yourself and everybody else. And it's streaming via Apple TV, which is a new streaming service. How, How do you think the morning show is going to change the landscape of television and streaming with this type of format? I mean, because it's really, it's a smart show. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't really know. It's hard to predict. There's, there's so much competition for shows out there and what gets seen and what pops and what doesn't. And I basically learned that nobody knows anything and you just have to make the best art you can and see what happens. I love when a tiny show like Fleabag cuts through and everyone sees it. That just makes me feel so wonderful. But as it pertains to the morning show, I guess the way I feel about it is that Jen and Reese did something very special with this show, which is they knew, they're smart, they're savvy. They knew if they came together and they were both on the same show, it would attract millions and millions of viewers because of their star power. They could have chosen a more easy subject that would have been inviting Mm -hmm. a lot more viewers, but they chose a really difficult subject, as you said, to make the show about, and they leveraged their star power to get people there, and I just think that's fucking cool. It is cool. I want to ask you about this one scene that you had with Reese. She's coming for an interview with you, and she's kind of yeah. she's kind of popping off to you about your name and how it sounds like an ice cream flavor. That scene felt like some of it was improv and some of it was scripted. Yeah, a lot of that was on the page. The writing is great. I can't take credit for it, but I will say I remember in that scene particularly, once Reese and I started overlapping all over each other, a couple of new things came out and gave it the energy of, of a real fight. You know, you're often on set, and, and the sound recorders will always say, please don't overlap your dialogue, you know? <laughs> and my thing is always like, no, you have to overlap it. It makes it feel real. And, and so definitely what you see there is more of the, the nitty-gritty stuff, and there's, there's definitely a little, a little improv going on there. And, and Reese is, you know, she is just great when it comes to that stuff. But Mark, thank you so much for talking to me. I appreciate you yeah. taking the time. This was great, and I'm really looking forward to how the show plays out in the long run. Well, I appreciate your thoughtful questions and your interest in the show, so thanks for the support. My pleasure. Take care. 
I was excited to talk to Mark Duplass because he is one of my favorites. I remember seeing him on the Mindy Project. I remember seeing him in so many. I mean, he has numerous projects that I could just rattle off at the drop of a hat. But this show in particular is really smart. And I think it's going to change the landscape of how we watch television and how we stream television and what type of shows we are interested in. And he's right. Reese and Jennifer are very smart in using their star power to bring it to this platform. Another person that's bringing their star power to this platform is Octavia Spencer. Octavia Spencer has a show on Apple TV Plus called Truth Be Told, where she plays a podcaster, Heller, <laughs> that has that is a crime that is a former crime reporter, and she stumbles up on a crime in which one of the people she had reported was guilty, she finds out that there's some evidence that may exonerate this person. So that's what the pilot is about. But it has a hella strong cast. If Hanifa Wood is in it, Tammy Roman is in it. It's so many people in that show that are good. I mean, I... I I can't say enough about it. I was so excited. I, I, I texted Octavia and was like, girl, this show is really good. I'm really happy for you. It's such a great show and it's such a great vehicle for her. Because if you remember a few years back, she was slated to do a African, she was slated to do a reboot of Murder, She Wrote, where she was going to be like an African-American version of Angela Lansbury. And I think it was going to be for NBC. And for whatever reason, the project was scratched. So this is kind of right up her alley where she's getting, she's, she's able to be a super sleuth, but in a completely different lane as a podcaster slash former reporter. It's really good. I enjoyed it. So you guys, and then there's another show that's on Apple TV Plus called C with Jason Momoa. I heard that one's really good. I haven't checked that one out just yet, but I heard that's good. And I heard that there's another show on there called, I think it's called The Elephant Queen. I heard that's really good too. But Apple TV Plus seems to, in the way, let me just flip back to Truth Be Told for a second. The way that it's shot, it looks like a feature film. It's shot beautifully. It's so good. The script is so good. Elizabeth Perkins is in that cast. Y'all, you have to check it out. If you have not signed up for that free trial at Apple TV Plus, because let me tell you something. I will always tell you about something free. If it's free, it's me. I'm just saying. Check out Apple TV Plus for free. And I think if you decide you want to... Um, Get a subscription to it is four ninety nine a month, which isn't a whole lot in the big scheme of things. But in comparison to all the other stuff that we have streaming, it kind of is. So I'm sure that there's probably some kind of package out there that has it included. Check it out and see what it is. All right, let me talk about my girl Jane Fonda. Y'all, she got arrested again. <laughs> Jane and got arrested again. And this time, let me see. Where is it? This time she got arrested and she uh, has been racking up friends along with her. You know, Jane Fonda's 81 years old. So the fact that she is getting arrested with her famous friends like Sam Watterson and Catherine Keenan, Keener, Catherine Keener, and Ted Danson and Rosanna Arquette is a trip. Like, I applaud her for just, she is all in to win it. She moved to D.C. back in September because she, like we talked about with Angelique, she wants to highlight the urgency of the climate crisis by staging these protests on the Capitol. Um, and she's always got on a bright red coat. Every time she goes, she wears that same little red coat to make sure you know it's her. But she says she she plans to keep on protesting until mid-January when the production of her Netflix show Grace and Frankie resumes and expects to turn 82 in jail on December 21st. I'm like, power to the people, Jane Fonda. I ain't mad at you. Robert Duvall and Martin Sheen have joined the cast of 21 Mighty Orphans. It's a drama that stars Luke Wilson as the legendary Texas football coach Rusty Russell. Ty Roberts is directing from a script that he wrote with Lane Garrison with... And that is from the acclaimed book by Jim Dent. So be on the lookout for that. Also be on the lookout for my friend and constituent and peer and sister in the struggle. Yvette Nicole Brown was here a little while back. Y'all know she got uh, Lady and the Tramp coming up on Disney Plus on November 12th. But it was announced this week that Yvette Nicole Brown, along with Unreal alumna Sherry Appleby, 
and John Stamos are going to be series regulars for a Disney Plus show called Big Shot. It is an original series written and executive produced by David E. Kelly and Dean Laurie. And um, it's part of the ABC Disney family. It's a 10 episode series and it follows a temperamental college basketball coach who gets fired from his job and must take a teaching and coaching job at an elite all girls private high school. So that is that. Oh my goodness, that was a lot to say. Let me see what y'all talking about in this chat room. What's going on over here? I was totally digging how Jane showed up for some award. Oh yes, when she showed up for the award show, we talked about that when Angelique was here last week. All right, I think that is it, y'all. I have talked about so much and brought y'all some stellar interviews. I want to thank again Mark Duplass for taking time out of his schedule to talk to me about the morning show on Apple TV Plus, which is streaming right now. I want to take time to thank again Miss Tina Martin Wyatt, Harriet Tubman's great great grandniece, and again Harriet is streaming, not streaming. Harriet is featured in theaters as of November 1st so you can catch that at any movie you can also catch my hosting of it um, for focus features on YouTube on Facebook anywhere where you can find focus features you will find that snippet and it's also on my social media and my IGTV next week y'all okay let me crack my neck we got a lot going on next week I have some interviews with the entire cast of A24's Waves. It is a ridiculously strong movie. It's one of my favorite movies of 2019. I'm going to just put that out there. I have a review of The Report. We have a review of Charlie's Angels, Ford vs. Ferrari, The Warrior Queen of Genzai, and a documentary called Scandalous about the National Enquirer. Enquirer. Yeah, the National Enquirer. So again, as always, I thank y'all for joining me. If this was your first time here, I hope you had a good time. If you were here before, like Michael B., Marlon Wallace, and Cup of Soul Show, thank you for joining me every Sunday and having my back. I saw, and I just want to say, Michael B., I just saw the comment that you left for me on, I forget what platform it was, but thank you for leaving that comment. I really appreciate it. I wish y'all were the other folks. Let me just say this, too, before I go. I run into a lot of people out in the street, out and about, that tell me that they watch The Curvy Critic with Carla Renata at Black Hollywood Live. I appreciate that. But could y'all not be doing it in the closet and let a sister know publicly and let other people know that you're watching it? Because if they knew you were watching it, they would watch it too. I'm not going to call out no names and I'm not going to call nobody out. But you know who you are. If you have watched this show, which I know you have, give me a thumbs up. Give me some comments and let folk know that you are watching because we work really hard here, Josh and I and Stephanie and I and whoever else happens to be my um, engineer producer at the time. We work really hard to bring y'all really stellar content. So let us know how we're doing. We'd appreciate it. All right. So until next week when we have the cast of Waves and all those other movies that I mentioned, I will see you then. Love, peace, and hair grease, y'all. Bam! <laughs> On behalf of our BHL staff, we would like to thank you for tuning in to Black Hollywood Live, the world's first digital broadcast network devoted entirely to urban entertainment and pop culture. Check out our Black Hollywood Live YouTube page for even more great programming and amazing content. And be sure to subscribe and like our channel when you do. I'm your BHL host, Nakia Monet, and you can find me on all social media at Kiki Boom Boom or at Black Hollywood Live. Black Hollywood Live, Hollywood Redefined.